other strategic centers have been liberated, but the battle for the Philippines is not yet finished. On northern Luzon Island, American troops move up the enemy-infested Villa Verde Trail. By their side march Filipino patriots carrying food and ammunition. Here in the mountains around San Nicolas, the Japanese are dug in. Artillery pounds heavy shells into Japanese positions on the ridges above. Now, the mortars. But the hard, bloody job of flushing each enemy fighter out of his foxhole, or killing him within, that belongs to the foot soldier. The Japanese on the ridge is shot down. This position is won. Many more must be taken before the complete liberation of the Philippines. To these men engaged in one of the war's toughest unsung jobs come food and mail from home. President Harry S. Truman, walking to the White House from his temporary official home just down the street, takes over full direction of his vast executive duties. First law to bear his presidential signature is the vital Lend-Lease Extension Act, which he had previously signed when he was president of the Senate. Nearly 400 journalists attend President Truman's first press conference. Most important of all, President Truman meets with the United States delegation to the San Francisco World Security Conference, which he later addressed by radio. Meanwhile, delegates from the United Nations arrive at San Francisco for the opening of the historic meeting. Prime Minister Jan Christian Smuts represents the Union of South Africa. From Russia come military and government advisors of the Soviet delegation. Back in Washington, to the White House comes Sergio Azmena, President of the Philippines. Members of the Judicial Committee of the San Francisco Conference signed their agreement on proposals for a world court under the security framework. Among principal delegates stopping to visit with Mr. Truman is Georges Bidot, French Foreign Minister. China's Foreign Secretary, Dr. T. V. Sung, also talks with the President. To Washington's National Airport, a United States transport brings Soviet Foreign Commissar Vyacheslav Molotov, who will head his nation's delegation at San Francisco. Secretary of State Statinius welcomes Mr. Molotov. Russian statesman is cheered by Washington crowds on his arrival at the capital's residence for distinguished visitors. Satinius and Molotov are joined by British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden in preliminary discussions on the eve of the San Francisco Conference. China. In age-old fashion, a fighting nation solves a transport problem. Empty gasoline drums are drawn hundreds of miles upriver from airfields for refilling at supply depots. The rivers of China fulfill their wartime role. 
with thousands of workers contributing their labor to the battle against their country's enemy. Where the current is swift, all hands pull on one boat for an inch by inch fight against the stream. This is one of the hard, primitive ways by which the war in China is being fought. German cities, a sea of ruins, graphically show how the Nazi leaders have dragged their own country down with them into utter chaos as they persist in a war hopelessly lost to the Allied armies which are cutting Germany to pieces. In town after town, street after street, infantry follows up the armored breakthrough. As the Battle of Germany nears its inevitable end, the full, grim meaning of present-day warfare is brought home to the German people. A Gestapo agent, posing as a Hollander, is manhandled by a German crowd, then hustled off to prison. With administrative Germany completely disorganized, German civilians loot coal yards, shops, and stores. Gone is the widely advertised German discipline. Now, members of the so-called master race run riot as they steal clothing from a supply train. This plunder was immediately recovered by the Allied military government. In a castle of 300 rooms, Americans find a German princess, indignant because Americans have been quartered in her palace. The Princess Valerie Marie of Schleswig-Holstein and her husband, Prince Arenberg, seem stunned by the swiftness of events. Here are slave workers, Czechs, Belgians, French, Poles from all over Europe, forced to work long hours under unspeakable conditions for the hated Nazis, each wears a slave number tattooed on her arm. Here, 30,000 Russian prisoners lie in a mass grave, victims of organized German atrocities. Liberated by the American armies, surviving Russian prisoners greet their allies with open arms and overflowing joy. Here, prisoners of a different kind. Masses of surrendered troops of the once great Wehrmacht are rounded up for internment. They pour in at a rate of 30,000 a day, more than two and a third million since last June's invasion, more than a million in the last month alone. American commanding officers of the 1st, 3rd, 7th, and 9th Armies meet with their group commander, General Omar Bradley, for a significant ceremony as Allied troops plunge straight across Germany for the junction with the Soviet armies. Up over a beaten, chaotic Germany is raised the American flag. 